Welcome everyone, bienvenue to a new Nazi discovery and what it meant for France in World War II, the Nazi religion and the rise of the French Christian resistance. AFUSA is the largest Alliance Francaise network in the world, helping 25,000 learners of French each year learn French, live French, and love French with the Alliance Francaise. So visit our website, AFUSA.org. We really have some fascinating things coming up with my friend Beth Gershnesek, Cubism and Tremploy. Um, Joseph Ledieu, Nelly Allard is going to be talking about her new book, and we are thrilled that Roger Mummert was going to come back and talk about myths and mysteries of the Bastille for Bastille Day. A few logistics. Please stay on mute during a presentation. Stay on speaker view. All questions should be in the chat, and we'll go over them at the end of the presentation. And if you have technical issues, sign back in after a couple of minutes using the original Zoom link. This event is being recorded for our YouTube channel, and the total runtime will be one hour. So I am thrilled to introduce today Dr. Kathleen Burton. Kathleen Burton recently retired in 2022 from the French department at Yale University, where she taught for over 15 years. Dr. Burton is a PhD in theology from l'Université Laval in Quebec. And she studied at the Sorbonne in Paris and at the Institut d'études politiques de Bordeaux. With her is Ruth Kozim, Emerita Senior Lector of French at Yale University. Ruth was named a Chevalier dans l'Ordre des Pâmes Académiques in 2013 and has given numerous presentations on teaching the German occupation period and the Shoah through the use of literature, film, and period documents in French. So I'm thrilled to introduce you both. I think Ruth is going to start, but welcome to both Ruth and Dr. Burton. Thank you so very much. So Kathleen, this the present book is the fruit of multiple decades of diligent and careful and painstaking research and scholarship. To get us started, would you trace what you feel are the high and perhaps even some of the low points of that journey so we have a sense of the development of the project? Well, I appreciate starting with that, Ruth, because it has been a 20 year endeavor, actually a little bit more than that. And uh, you've been, been there most of the way along. Both of us retired at the same time from Yale. And it's just, um, I wanted to start by thanking Alliance Francaise USA for this opportunity, thank Renee and Melissa uh, Bougie by, behind the scenes uh, and uh, David behind the scenes and uh, to be able to uh, put this together. And most of all, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time um, to uh, listen to um, my new published book, and it has been, it was originally published in 2006 by uh, Laval University Press, and uh, since then, and teaching at Yale, I've been researching and updating and translating and finding new discoveries, and finally, I said that's it with the, with the retiring last spring and with Roman and Littlefield publishing the book in the fall, uh, they gave their great blessing on going on the speaking tour, and I'm just very grateful that you're here um, and, and with us uh, today. So I think that uh, with, um, with that, I'm going to just go into a little bit of introduction. Perfect. Um, I have a few slides just to introduce the topic before we actually get into the book contents. So I'll take the, um, the next scene, uh, the next slide. I like to start with um, the uh, Nazi religion and the rise of the French Christian resistance, the cover of the book, because the cover of the book actually tells and introduces the two stories that are told in it. And uh, the superior part of the cover, actually, I designed the cover with the um, graphic designer in, um, in, uh, at Roman and Littlefield. And uh, the superior portion is an actual stained glass window in um, Worms Cathedral in Germany. And this shows, uh, it's part of what they call their atonement series. And um, it shows the Nazi stormtrooper. And then it also shows the swastika and his pistol. And, his oversized hand of pressing this uh, Jewish gentleman with the Star of David. And then it fades into the second portion. So of course the uh, superior portion represents the Nazi religion. And then the second is the rise of the French Christian resistance with the French flag. So um, I really like to start with that. And uh, also um, oftentimes 
people say to me, why haven't I heard of the Nazi religion? Why don't I know about the Nazi religion? It seems something that we should know about. And if, if you will, we all know that um, Hitler was a diabolically gifted propagandist. And in a sense, he still has a very strong coup of propaganda because this is something that still is unknown. And I'm very grateful that you took the time to find out more about it today. Um, next slide, Melissa. I did want to introduce the fact that you're not the only ones maybe that didn't necessarily know a lot about the Nazi religion. As a matter of fact, uh, in the entourage of Hitler himself, closest to him in this Nazi party didn't really know about it either because they didn't take the time to read about it. And I use this example of Albert Speer because he did not, um, uh, he was not hung in the Nuremberg trials after the war. He um, confessed and he repented and spent 26 years in prison where he wrote his autobiography. And so I like to use this excerpt um, to illustrate that um, even those closest to Hitler uh, did not know about the actual underpinnings of the 1000 year Reich. And he says, my decision to enter Hitler's party was no less frivolous. Why did I, why did I not undertake a thorough systematic investigation? of say the value or worthlessness of the ideologies of all the parties. Why did I not read the various party programs? Or at least Hitler's Mein Kampf and Rosenberg's Myth of the 20th Century, which are the two essential tenets, uh, the two essential um, writings of literature for the Third Reich. Um, and uh, just one, a couple other points in the introduction is who did know about, uh, the next slide please, Melissa who did know about uh, what was happening. And I would like to say proudly that our ambassador, William Dodd, who was in Berlin at the time of the uh, beginning of the Third Reich and through the 30s, he's also highlighted in Eric Larson's, this book you've probably seen the, the, in the Garden of the Beast, but Eric Larson also highlights the Dodd family, but spends most of his time talking about his daughter's liaison with you know, the different Nazi party people where I would like to put the emphasis on William Dodd, our ambassador, who was doing his very best to communicate to Roosevelt, to the Congress and to the American people that they were, we were dealing with a very different beast, if you will, um, that was emerging in Nazi Germany in the 30s. And you see this book on the left, it's called, it's called The Nazi Primer. And it's a very rare book. And uh, this, in this book, when it was first translated into English, our ambassador, William Dodd, wrote, wrote a commentary for the book. And this book you can read is the official handbook for schooling of the Hitler youth. And actually, Melissa, if you could go full screen, I wanted to just read um, a very, very short um, little paragraph because he touches exactly on our topic today of my book. And in this is a very rare book. I'm very fortunate that a, a colleague of mine was able to get me a copy. He writes, a meeting was called by the Hitler party in 1934 in Wittenberg. Preachers and others were att to attend and shout the praise of the new Fuhrer and of the ancient Aryan religion, which was being restored and elaborated by the curious Rosenberg, who was also doing so much to control education. The new religion was designed to unite all Germans in one faith. So this is from this, uh, the Nazi primer. And just one other thing I wanted to, um, to present to you that uh, we had an excellent um, ambassador at the time. Um, I also wanted to um, go back to the slides because um, I just wanted to highlight also another group. Uh, so if I could have the next slide, Melissa. This is a group that were active in Europe and particularly out of England called the Friends of Europe. And I talk quite a bit about them in my book because they had a very impressive 70 pamphlets that they were trying to get information out um, to the general public and also to uh, governmental officials about what was happening in Nazi Germany. Um, and they did a, a very intense study. One third of those actual pamphlets dealt with this religion, religious question of the Nazi religion and dealt with Alfred Rosenberg in particular. But they had very, very um, uh, well um, uh, noted people publishing in it. You can see Albert Einstein published on Nazi politics, Winston Churchill on British policy. And so this group also were very, very keenly aware. There are many theologians and um, many pastors who had written even American theologians at the time studying the myth of the 20th century and trying to bring that to the fore. And the last actual slide, Melissa, if you could give me the next one is the last one. 
And the reason I bring this up is because of my students at Yale. They said, Dr. Burton, please tell people about the Evian Conference of 1938 because they didn't know about it. And you can certainly Google it and find more information. But what's important is that this was America's opportunity to step up with the 32 other industrialized nations in 1938 uh, to help France deal with the one quarter of a million Jewish refugees that were flooding into Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité from the East. And so America decided to sponsor the conference in Evian. So we Americans paid for this conference of 32 nations that came together just before the war, as you see, in 1938, and to deal and try to help France with their refugee problem. But we actually, in effect, absolutely did nothing. America included. Our immigration policies were very tight then. And um, there that we basically helped them with not any of the refugees. Britain either did not help. They had the kinder transport later where they helped with 20,000 refugee children, um, hoping they would reunite with their parents. But of course, we all know what happened to their parents. And the only nation was the Dominican Republic. So hats off to Dominican Republic who took refugees into their Caribbean homes. But um, it's important for us to know that we had a certain responsibility too for all of those um, foreign Jews in France that ended up in the trains going to the camps. And so I'd like to finish my introduction with the Evian Conference. So um, in part one of your book, you know, you've mentioned Nazi religion. Um, you talk about the Nazi religion as a self-defined religion. Um, if you could go into a little more detail about that, um, what were the components of the definition? We don't usually think of religions as something that we get to invent. Exactly. Indeed, that's very true. And uh, thank you very much. Um, I will take the next uh, slide. I'm sorry, I forgot to say full screen. Sorry, Ruth. But um, I'll take the next slide because I would like to um, introduce to you how the religious perspective of Nazism uh, came about. And interestingly enough, here I use this, um, this picture of a painting that Hitler commissioned by Hermann Hoyer. Uh, you can you know, see the title in the beginning was the word. You can see obviously the mimicking right of uh, the faithful disciples of Nazism listening to Hitler um, very much uh, as a similar analogy to disciples listening to, um, to Christ. So uh, this picture I used to introduce um, the religious perspective because it's not Kathleen Burton who's saying that the Nazis were religious. It is the Nazis themselves that are saying that they were religious. And in the party platform of 1920, they had 25 points. And just like other political parties at the time, if in 1920, we can imagine what Germany was like, it was the time of the Weimar Republic, it was the end of the First World War, the entire uh, economy had tanked, they were suffering under the uh, Treaty of Versailles, but there was lots of freedom in Munich at the time. And so you had lots of parties and the Nazis were just one of them. And they said, oh, please come and listen to our uh, speaker for the Nazi party. If you believe in these principles, most of which are extremely anti-Semitic, um, then uh, please come and listen to our speaker. Now, in my book, I go over some of those points and there's the whole list of 25 at the back of the book. But we're going to focus right now on particularly one point in that party platform. And so if I could have the next slide, Melissa. In the 25 points of the Nazi party, point number 24 is, and you read with me in orange if you will, the party as such represents the standpoint of positive Christianity without binding itself confessionally to a particular faith. Let me read this again for you because here we get the terminology of the Nazi religion. The party as such represents the standpoint of positive Christianity without binding itself confessionally to a particular faith. Could I have full screen, please, Melissa? So I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about this terminology, because we have positive and we have Christianity. Now, positive, the word positive, if you look it up in the German, French, or English dictionaries, there are at least eight different definitions of the word positive, if not more. And this is how the Nazis rolled. They used a lot of different obscure definitions of words to confuse people because the intention was to confuse. The intention was to obscure. The intention was to not make clear. 
And here with positive, they rode that wave quite well in getting support of the Christians and getting into the Reichstag, the majority. But in the positive Christianity is a very clear definition of what is absolutely real, what is concrete, what is non-mystical, what is um, non-obscure as far as the faith is concerned. So that's going to lead us to, well, there's no original sin, because what is that? So in positive Christianity, there is no original sin. There is no um, uh, immaculate conception, resurrection from the dead. And, it, and I go into all the different tenets that we'll be talking about after. So positive Christianity, that's the positive. What about Christianity? Well, if we take a moment to think about Christianity, it's based on the Bible, as we all know. Well, the entire Old Testament is the history of the Jewish people. If you have a Nazi party that is extremely anti-Semitic and killed 6 million Jews in the Holocaust, obviously they're not going to want to highlight the Old Testament history of the Jewish people. There's no Old Testament in positive Christianity. In um, the New Testament, well, the New Testament can be problematic as well because it's written pretty much by Jews who converted to Christianity, yes, but Paul of Tarsus in particular poses a lot of problems for the Nazis, so they pick and choose on what they take out of the New Testament. So positive Christianity also begs the question, what is negative Christianity, which is traditional Christianity? And finally, um, I want to help you understand that positive Christianity is really original Christianity. And that's why in point 24, it says that they are not bound to any other confessional faith because they're not the original, because positive Christianity is the original. And this is the premise from which they debark um, into uh, the myth of the 20th century. So um, shall we go on to- We should absolutely go on. So this is really uh, quite the concept. Um, a brand new religion or going back to a very re original religion that somehow people were too benighted to uh, recognize for the 1000 year Reich, Reich excuse me. Um, how was this going to be implemented? I mean, there were people who were members of other confessional faiths. How were, what was the idea? How were they going to plan to kind of get people on board with this new religion? Exactly. You know, I'm really glad Ruth also that she used that analogy with new religion because they were constantly saying the Nazis are a new religion. They always said, we're not a new religion. We're not a new religion. And Hitler often was citing God, God in his speeches, but they are not, we're not a new, we're the original. So this was the playing of words that worked so well in their favor. The next slide, Melissa. This is Alfred Rosenberg. No, Alfred Rosenberg is not Jewish. Americans often think that Rosen and Rosenberg is a Jewish name. It's actually a very German name. If you go to Germany, Austria, uh, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, um, you will find many Germans with the name Rosenberg. Of course, the Hitler's not going to have an intimate of his party be a Jew. Alfred Rosenberg was born in Tallinn, what is now Estonia. Um, he did his studies, at, did his doctorate at Moscow University in architecture. And then when the Bolshevik Revolution came, he went on to Munich where he found the, Nazi, um, the Nazis and joined the party very, very early. Now, um, Rosenberg was hung at Nuremberg at the end of the war. And so had, had came became rather obscure, his name, and that was for other reasons, but people didn't really want to know about how prominent he was. But it is very important to start by saying that he was an extremely prominent member of the Nazi party and very well known. He was, first of all, the editor of the newspaper, Nazi newspaper, and then he was head of the Nazi party when Hitler was in prison, where he could visit him often and collaborate their efforts with their two books. Um, he was also uh, made the Minister of Education in the Third Reich. He was also in charge of the expansion to the Eastern Territories as Reichleiter. He was also in charge of the pillaging of Western art in France, Belgium, and every other occupied country. There's a reason for that as well. Um, and then after the Catholic Church signed the Concordant or their treaty with the uh, Nazi regime, um, Rosenberg was made the leader of the spiritual and intellectual leader of the Nazi party. And finally, he was only one of nine to receive the national prize personally from Hitler. So here is his book, The Myth of the 20th Century. 
And we're, of course, we're thinking about the question, all right, so we've heard of Mein Kampf, we're going to talk about that very soon. So what exactly is the myth of the 20th century and its contents? We have the next slide, please, Melissa. The myth of the 20th century, its publication was from 34, 150,000 at the beginning of the war to begin educating the Nazi party members, as well as the Hitler youth, starting with the primer we saw earlier. 1936, half a million, and by the end of the war, between one and two million copies that were circulating for the education of the great Aryan German race. The cornerstones of this um, of every building that Hitler uh, built, you saw earlier Albert Speer, who was his architect and responsible for the vast majority of the buildings. Remember, the Nazis were in power from 1933 until the end of the war in the mid 40s. They built a lot of buildings and they were building for a thousand year right. And we're going to come back to the cornerstone ceremonies in a little bit. But what's the content of the myth of the 20th century? Well, in my book, I go into, of course, a lot more detail. But let me highlight by saying that it traces human history from the moment of the great disaster in the north of the Aryan race and how that disaster landed the Aryan race into different cultures where they were to be able to set up the caste system with the race, with the Aryan uh, Teutonic Germanic race at the top of the caste. And so you can come, the Aryans went into Persia where you had Aryan Persia where the caste system was established, but unfortunately it fell apart through miscegenation and mixing of the races. And so then it went on to Greece. And so you had Aryan Greece and the rise of the, of, of the in the establishment of the uh, aristocratic families and the, the caste system in Greece. And as we know, Gre Greece fell as well. So it went on to Aryan Rome. And of course, you had the patrician families and the establishment of the Senate by all of the, uh, the caste system that was then established. So you have this whole long history of human history um, see, saying that um, the Aryan race was supposed to gain supremacy. Why? Because the Aryan race in positive Christianity and in Nazism is the original chosen people. The Jewish race were usurpers of that position. And so the story of history is for the Aryan race to gain that hegemony once again, as we were talking about the rejection of the Old Testament. And Jesus, of course, is not a Jew. You can't have Jesus a Jew in positive Christianity and in a thousand year Reich of the Aryan race. Jesus was from the diaspora Aryan people that settled in the north of Africa. He's from the Amorite tribes that were 2,500 years BC. Those Aryan tribes migrated to the Near East of what is now Palestine and Israel, and they founded Jerusalem, and Jesus was an Amorite. So this is what you will find amongst many other things in my book and in uh, the myth of the 20th century. This is where I think I'm going a little bit longer. Uh, the next slide, please. This is how it's organized, the myth. It's organized in three books. Book one, The Conflict of Values, where race soul is the Aryan race soul. Book two, The Nature of German Art. So obviously he's chosen to deal with uh, salvaging what they can of Aryan art from the Western European countries during the war. And then book three, The Coming Reich. And you might want to look at chapter five, which is about church and school in the 1000 year Reich. So this was um, something I wanted to add in here, the organization actually of the myth itself. And I go into that in much more detail in the book. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is an interesting visual that I wanted to end this uh, short section because uh, this book by Susanna Heschel is a very interesting one with the visual. You can see as early as 1935, there was the beginnings of the transition to positive Christianity in the churches with the swastika taking precedent over a crucifix or a cross. And you have the Aryan Jesus. Her book is very interesting because it traces the establishment of an institution um, that was established by the theologians following positive Christianity in the Third Reich. And this institute was called the Institute for the Eradication of All Things Jewish in German Life. And this institute is where they began the rewriting of the New Testament. So all very interesting. Okay, uh, full screen, please, uh, Melissa. So really, there are two very key, 
besides your book, uh, <laughs> two, two very key books, Mein Kampf, which most of us have over, had heard of already, but the myth of the 20th century, which for many people I'm sure is a new discovery. How can you tell us a little bit about the synergy between those two? I mean, one was Hitler's book, one was Rosenberg's book. Rosenberg was obviously a favorite for Hitler. Um, how did those work together to further the aim of instituting positive Christianity? This is such an important point because if you read one without the other, you really don't get, especially Mein Kampf, because he makes many, several, my book treats the religious references in Mein Kampf. I'm only going to choose one. Uh, could I have the next um, slide, please, Melissa? Oh, this is, oh, I'm sorry, this is the part about the diary, of course, oh. of course, because, um, and Ruth, and I, 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 she was one of the first person I told about this, this discovery, I went rushing into her office. Here I was in the middle of my research, you know, and in 2013, what surfaces but the Homeland Security that finds Rosenberg's personal diary, can you imagine? They find it in New York State. They take this diary, they take it directly to the United States Holocaust Museum. And in record time, over 400 pages were translated. And in that translation, then they published it. And by, 19, uh, by 2015, had the publication, which is actually the political diary of Alfred Rosenberg, uh, the political diary of Alfred Rosenberg and the onset of the Holocaust which is such an important book because not only does it show us the importance of Rosenberg during his time before uh, the war and into the early years, but it also gives me my third reference for the cornerstones that I will talk to you about um, a little bit later. Um, next slide, please, Melissa. Now, as, uh, as Ruth was very well um, uh, noting, we've all heard of Mein Kampf. We all know it means my struggle. Um, it is a book that was written when Hitler was in prison in 1923. So interestingly enough, he makes Rosenberg the head of the party so they can collaborate their books while he's writing it. It's basically a summary of the 25 points of the Nazi party in two volumes. And it's also interesting that it was a forbidden book to be published in Germany for 60 years after the war. So in 2013, it was published in Germany, in German for the first time, 4,000 copies sold the very first week. So that's rather interesting as far as uh, Mein Kampf itself. But the references of uh, Hitler in his book, I highlight in, uh, in my book because I want it once again to be Hitler's words, not mine. So on the next slide, if I could have the next one, Melissa, is just one of the important quotes that I treat in my book. And we're just going to look at the center portion here, but this is coming directly from Hitler himself in Mein Kampf. Until the emotional concept or yearning has been transformed into an active service that is governed by a clearly defined doctrinal faith, in other words, positive Christianity, original Christianity, such a faith furnishes the practical outlet for religious feeling to be expressed itself and thus opens the way through which it can be put into practice, which is the 1000 year Reich, the education of the Aryan chosen rice Germanic peoples, um, through the myth of the 20th century. So you can see that clarifications of one volume are found in the other book and vice versa, which is very important as far as that's concerned. Another point I wanted to make before we left uh, Hitler is uh, in the next slide, Melissa, if you would, are the three points that um, the religious plan of Hitler. Now, Hitler could not have arrived in power without the Christian churches the Reichstag majority that the Nazi party got because he gained the trust of the positive, Christiani positive Christianity churches, as you saw in Cologne in 1935 in the cover of the book, but also he needed to gain power over the churches. And my book explains to you how he does that, how he just establishes one central bishop that he wanted all the Protestants to be under. And then he of course wanted to replace the churches as we saw in um, the book cover from Heschel's book. But also we had a very clear plan for the Roman Catholic Church and for the Protestant Church. Um, full screen, Melissa. Kathleen, in your book, you use a really charged word to describe uh, this enterprise of 
bringing the various uh, new churches rather than the original yeah. church, uh, under the banner of positive Christianity. You say that uh, Hitler set about duping first the Catholic church and then later on the Protestant church, but let's stay with the Catholic church. Um, as I say, that's a very, that's a very charged word. Um, this wasn't just pretty please join us. Um, how did he go about this? I mean, he was a clever fellow. Yes, very good. And a propaganda with the Christian churches as well. And he had a lot of help. Um, next slide, please, Melissa, and that would help me um, explain it to um, our viewers more. This is, um, I'm going to start with the Catholic Church. Um, uh, as we know, or as we um, are probably aware, is France was a Catholic country. Germany was not. Germany was a Protestant country, still is a Protestant country. Bavaria is Catholic. Um, and Austria is also Catholic. Austria was not occupied till 1938. Um, so in the Weimar Republic, where we were talking about the German, the, the Nazi party, you know, asking and recruiting people to come join their party, um, during that time, the Catholic Church made great inroads into Protestant Germany. They established their own political parties. They established their own newspapers. They established their own um, institution of higher learning and their uh, also uh, primary schools. And they wanted to keep all of that uh, influence during the Third Reich with Hitler. So they negotiated a treaty very early on. And I go into the reasons for that in my book because Pit Hitler arrived in power in January, 1933. And suddenly, seven, less than seven months later, they have a treaty with the Vatican in 1933. And when the ink was dry, or even before on that treaty, the Nazis decided to interpret what was political um, uh, in their own way. And so the political parties of the Catholic Church disappeared, the institutions of higher learning were closed, there were, in, there were uh, allegations of sexual misconduct in the monasteries, in the orphanages, and, and, and also uh, the residential schools, the Catholic schools. And uh, so the Catholic Church, um, we saw more and more uh, its, um, its wrists tied by this treaty. And even though they had uh, many different visits to Nazi Germany uh, complaining, um, they had made um, a real coup against um, the, the Catholic Church, even though the Catholic Church was very aware of what was in the myth of the 20th century. But uh, somehow Hitler himself said that, well, that's just the ideas of one of the members of my party. And we do have religious freedom in my country as long as you do not try to influence in any way the German Aryan um, uh, chosen people race that is now the Thousand, thousand Year Reich. And they were accused of doing that. And this uh, is actually a problem, if I could have the next slide for France, just briefly, I wanted to mention, because France is a Catholic country. And so when that treaty was signed, it really caused great problems for the uh, Jesuits and for the, um, for the congregate Catholic uh, populace in general in France. And we're going to treat that in the third part of my book. But here you have a picture of Pétain, who was chosen by Hitler to be the chief of state for the occupied zone in France in the center with representatives of the Catholic Church. Um, Hitler had representatives of the Catholic Church with him as well because of this treaty. So we'll talk about that actually a little bit more later. I think we're gonna go into the full screen. Okay. Yeah, full screen, please, Melissa, thank you. So with the, the Concordat, the Catholic Church was effectively sidelined, sidelined yes. um, certainly seriously undermined in their potential for doing anything to counter the rise of the of the Nazis. Exactly. What about the Protestant church in Germany? Um, you say in your book that although Germany in most areas was primarily Protestant, Protestantism, the Protestant church was only a weak shield against, again, this onrush, this, this onward march of, of Nazism. Could you go into a little more detail about that? I mean, if most people in Germany were Protestants, why wasn't that a big deal? Exactly. And uh, we can see that in, uh, I don't have time to go through in detail, but I did want to introduce, if I could have the next slide, um, what many people didn't know about, which was some uh, movement called 
the uh, German Christian movement, and this is their flag. Many of the theologians in Germany, the teaching faculty at many of the theological schools had already been duped into positive Christianity and into the German Christian movement. It began in the late 19th century with Paul Lagarde and with Chamber, uh, Houston, Houston, uh, Stuart Houston Chamberlain and uh, Alfred von Harnack. And that was fine when it stayed in academia but it didn't stay in academia and it was uh, spread very quickly and it was on the, um, the wave of the German Christian movement uh, that uh, the Nazis uh, rose to the point of having the majority in the Reichstag. But there was uh, actually two voices that I highlight in my book. The next slide, please, Melissa, because these were extraordinary prominent, um, prominent leaders in the Protestant community, but the problem was they couldn't unite together. And because of that, this caused a problem. And I go into this a lot in my book, but I do like to highlight them. And they were extraordinary in their own rights. Uh, Paul Tillich, who um, was a Lutheran pastor, he was a chaplain in the trenches during the First World War and saw the bodies piling up. He couldn't bury them fast enough. Very, very um, uh, acute uh, experience in the First World War that sent him very strongly into religious socialism. And he wrote the 10 Theses Against the Nazis. And this was written in 32, he was exiled to the United States in 33. But he was really a very prominent voice because he attacked the Nazis at the crux of the matter. Point 24 of the Nazi party program says you're a religious movement. And he tried very hard to get this across to the other theologian. Can I have the next slide please, uh, Melissa? Who was Karl Barth? very famous uh, theologian, himself also a member of the religious socialist movement, but left in 1919 and became very Christocentric. And the problem in the, between these two theologians was that Barth wanted to attack the German Christian movement. He didn't want to attack the na Nazis in a political uh, way straight off. And that drove the two of them apart, which didn't bring a united shield, about a weak Christian shield. He did um, effectively bring the Barman Declaration. He did, he was exiled to Switzerland. In 1940, after the war, he, uh, he, he does a turnaround in Volkswagen um, about, oh, no, we really should be attacking the Nazis on their political platform. They are a self-defined religious movement. And from then on, he actually published uh, in France in the underground newspaper and was very powerful with the Protestants in, in France. So I go on a lot about these two theologians that if they could have, we might have seen a very different situation uh, for France during the war. In, uh, full screen, please, Melissa. Indeed, and you, you know, you're, we're now getting to France. Very, very vast topic, but what would you say are the most essential things for us to know or to understand concerning the situation in France at this point so that we can really appreciate the significance of your discoveries and your thesis. Um, I appreciate that because it's important to have a little introduction. We've touched on some of the points and that's why I wanted to mention earlier when uh, we talked about that France is a, a, is a Catholic country. But we're going to go into France now before we have to uh, move into the uh, end and the question answers. And this is my favorite part. So if we can go to the next, the next slide. <sighs> The background of France in 1939 uh, was in World War I, the French people lost 1.4 million men, more than uh, all of America and all of its wars combined. So they did not want another war, of course. Also France in 30s uh, was the time of Franco and the refugees were pouring in by the thousands into the south of France. That's why you had concentration camps already in the south of France. The Spanish then did leave around the middle of the 30s and all of the quarter of a million refugee Jews ended up filling up those camps. Um, we did talk already about the fleeing Jews and then from, from the East, but there's also the collaborationism that divided France and almost caused a civil war in France where you had your mom and dad feeling that they should be loyal to Pétain and you had the children wanting to join the militant resistance or the Christian resistance movement. Uh, and even more important, and this is the last um, introduction before we go into the end with Pierre Chaillet, is in 1940, France is cut into not just two zones, France was cut into seven zones. If I could have the next slide, please, Melissa. France was cut, was basically butchered like no other country in the Second World War. As a matter of fact, there wasn't a time since the time of Joan of Arc in the 15th century 
where France almost disappeared off, the uh, off of the map of Europe. You don't have just the occupied zone in the north and the free zone in the south. You have the Italian zone in the southwest. Uh, you have the, zone, the annexed zone that was just taken by Germany. Uh, in the east, you have the reserve zone as a, as a buffer zone between those. You have the northern zone, which was given to the Belgium uh, administration. And then you had the forbidden zone. And so you have seven different zones. And this was uh, obviously extremely problematic. And in my book, I explain to you why. Why were the Germans so afraid of France? And it comes because of the Aryan Huguenot Protestants of France and how they compromised themselves. And then you had the, um, the uh, revolution and the universal human rights declarations, and it was all downhill from there. And they have a very long border with France. Next slide, please. This is my hero, Pierre Chaillet. He was the head of the French Christian resistance. And then you'll note that it says Christian resistance. He very, very, very strongly pursued an interworkings between Protestants and Catholics. He is not recognized by the Vatican, nor is he recognized by the church in France. His underground newspaper in 1997 was recognized, but he himself was not. Next slide. And um, also Yad Vashem and Israel have recognized him as uh, one, of the, um, just, one of the just among the nations. But he was a, a scholar on the early church and the unity of the early church. As a Jesuit priest, when he came back to France, uh, the late 30s, he was not in France. He was scandalized that the, that the Catholic Church was not doing much while the Protestants were very organized, hiding Jews, getting them papers, getting them, in the, them into Switzerland, getting them into um, Spain. But um, uh, luckily, he decided that he was going to go and he was going to approach his Christian brethren and say, why don't we work together? So the third point here, you see CIMAD, which was a Protestant organization, and they formed together Catholics and Protestants, the Christian friendship, and they achieved vast, vastly more than they could have on their own. But most of us know that the time uh, between the Protestants and the Catholics and the Middle Ages and the tens of thousands of people that were butchered, either Protestant or Catholic, and to see a cooperation between the two is extraordinary. And this led, and this kind of cooperation, where they were sort of estranged with the weak shield in Germany, led to three quarters of the French Jews surviving the war. Next slide, please. This on, uh, on the right-hand side is a list of the 15 publications of the Underground Christian Witness, which was the newspaper established by them, letting, letting every archbishop and every bishop in the south of France and in the occupied zone as best they could about what was happening in Nazi Germany, what was happening in occupied Poland, what was happening in now um, uh, integrated Austria. And they were delivered to every archbishopric and every bishop in the uh, south and in the north. On the left are, are the little tracks that they made. They couldn't give a 30-page newspaper to everyone. So they would highlight and hand them to the priests in the different um, parishes. But the real coup came uh, on the next slide, Melissa. The real coup came when finally Archbishop Saliège in 1942, if you see the second point here, this message was read in every church in the region on the same Sunday in September 1942. So the Nazis could do nothing to stop it because Saliège wanted to show that the Catholics had to get the word from the pulpit of what they had to start doing as the Protestants were doing. Jews are men, Jewish women are women. Everything is not allowed against them, against these men, women, fathers, and, and mothers. They are part of the human race. They are our brothers and sisters like so many others. A Christian cannot forget this. And this turned the tide to help with that three quarters of the French Jews surviving. Which brings us to the afterword. All right. The afterword. Um, if we just have, we have the full screen. Thank you. I'm going to confess that I do not always uh, read the afterword uh, when I read a scholarly book. I am hoping I'm not the only one in this group today who has that personal failing. <laughs> um, your afterword, however, I'm very glad I did read because um, it's really fascinating in that you mention some tantalizing possibilities for 
future discoveries that could really open up some, maybe not new directions, but um, certainly give credence to uh, your, your work that you've been doing for all of these years. Tell us a little bit about that. That's just absolutely right, Ruth. And now the last, uh, the last slide actually before the, the flyer, please, Melissa, if you will. This is a slide that, uh, as you see, three clear references to Mein Kampf in the myth of the 20th century buried in the Nuremberg Congress Hall cornerstone and several other cornerstones of the Nazis uh, buildings um, are something that I really want to prove. And I have three clear references to that. Here in this picture, you have Nuremberg. This is the great sports plots, Congress Hall. You know the images of the 40,000 goose-stepping German Nazi soldiers and the great um, spotlights on the swastikas. And this all happened here in Nuremberg. And in this Congress Hall um, are buried the two books next to each other, like two volumes, like two testaments almost, if you will, for the Thousand Year Reich. And they were debating in 2016 to tear this place down. They have um, since decided not to, and you can visit it. You can um, go in and visit the whole thing. And I'll be visiting it with a very specific purpose to show that those two books are in the cornerstone and maybe a discovery channel, maybe a history channel to be able to get this information out. So that's uh, in on my afterward as, as well as several other things. But now it's just the flyer that Melissa is gonna show in the last slide and then we can take questions. This flyer is from Roman and Littlefield, my publisher who wanted to support my speaking tour. And if you look in the chat, you can find the uh, code, which if you enter that code that Melissa is showing on the screen, you can just, you can either call Barnes and Noble or Amazon or, um, or call. All you have to do is give that code and they'll give you a 30% discount on whichever version of the book you want, an ebook or a paperback or hardback. And so I wanted to thank Roman and Littlefield. So we're all set for questions if there are any and then you would like to field them and thank you so much for staying the course with us. I don't know who is that. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Um, it's Renee here. So thank you, Renee. You have from um, from Anne Brunger. Her, her question is as follows. How did the Aryan invaders of northern India fit into the Aryan race? Hitler. Very good question, actually, into India, because in the myth of the 20th century, it's India that's treated the most because from the Nazi positive Christianity point of view, they got it the best and the most correct before they were infiltrated by, you know, mixed races and mixed marriages and the, and the uh, challenges to the caste system. But they were actually part of the original diaspora from the North. Um, now, in the myth of the 20th century, uh, Rosenberg will um, allude to it as, you know, he, he says, of course, you've heard words like Valhalla and you've heard words like Atlantis. And in our days now, they're doing more and more proving and finding more and more amazing discoveries. But the reality is, is that the diaspora of the Aryan people came from the Nordic peoples of the Teutonic tribes. And that diaspora then came to India. And then that's where he comes. This is where the swastika comes from, um, as many yes. of you know. And um, he goes into the Upanishads and the Vedas and he sees all of the glorious poetry that came out because they held on to the caste system with the Aryan race, of course, having the highest level, very much like what the, what the Indians call the Brahmins. Good night, thank you for that question, Anne. Melissa, do we see any other questions? Not at the moment. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat. It says four here on my screen, but maybe you can't uh, you can't see them. We have put no, the I... link for you for oh, uh, of course, the link is to buy yes. the book into the chat. Yes, yeah. of course. I don't want to say that we usually get more questions from our Yale undergraduates. <laughs> That's true, especially about the Evian conference. They were very, very keen on knowing about that and for their parents to know about that. Um, and 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 I was quite keen too because there's there's always been you know a bit of like a, a dark cloud hanging over France because so many of the foreign Jews were sent out of France on train loads to the camps, but it wasn't all Fr France. Very much tried to reach out to the other countries. They just happened to be the country that was the proximity to Germany to run to. Uh, let's see. Thank. You. Mm -hmm. 
Elizabeth Ziffer has a question. May I ask it out loud? Is that okay, Renee? Um, I, I guess we could normally, sure. Elizabeth, do you not want to put it in the chat? Whatever, let's hear the question. In the meantime, we, have another question. Say, yeah. we have another question too from Ellen in the meantime. Okay, what sure. Is, what Go is ahead, the relationship? Elizabeth. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. In the I meantime, I have to take her off, off of mute. What was the relationship of the Pope to the takeover of the German Catholic Church by the Nazis? Oh, well, I certainly treat that quite a bit in my book, because um, as you know, you know, it was it was uh, Pope Pius XI, who was the Pope just up until 1939. And then you had a switch over to Pope Pius XII, and his name was Pacelli. And Pacelli was very interested. He was, um, he had a lifetime and all of his family worked in the Vatican as Vatican lawyers. He was very involved in setting up the new canon codes and he wanted to centralize the canon codes of the Vatican and worked very much on that. He also drafted the Concordant, the actual peace oh. treaty. And he also spent as the representative of Pope Pius XI, he was the, uh, the Vatican, what they call the nuncio, or the representative of the Vatican in Berlin at the time of the establishment of the Nazi party into the 20s and early 30s. So he really knew what was going on with the Nazi party. So really, he should have known better. The hurrying aspect of the concordant, seven months later, he had his treaty signed had a lot to do with him wanting to withdraw the political parties because he was in accord with Hitler about that because he wanted to centralize the power at the Vatican and didn't want to have decentralizing of the power of the Catholic Church and particularly in Germany where it wasn't even Catholic territory. So they actually had a couple of reasons to want to sign the treaty. But in the end, if you ask me my opinion, he should have known better and there was no reason to hurry. And it really, really tied things very uh, in very difficult ways for Catholic countries, such as Austria that was occupied in 38, and then of course France, which was occupied in 1940. And I go much more into the Concordat and things in my book. Thank you for the question. So Elizabeth Ziffer has asked, uh, she's, she had wanted to ask in person, but here's her question. Do you include the story of Andre Trokmi in your book? Your talk has been extremely helpful to me. Thank you for telling us about Etienne Chaillet and the témoignage chrétien. I heard the story of Le Chambon in my 1960s childhood. Uh, Chambon sur Lignon uh, touches everyone. Um, it's been even made into a film. If you want to look on, um, on uh, Netflix or YouTube, you could probably find it. The Trocme family were extraordinary, but even more extraordinary was the Protestant community itself. And because it, it takes a village, as the expression goes, and it certainly did take a village to incorporate not only Jews, also, um, other peoples that were fleeing the, um, the, the Nazi regime uh, found um, uh, a harbor, a safe harbor uh, in that little village that was in the middle of nowhere up on the hill. I don't know if a lot of people knew that Tukme himself lost his son uh, in the camps. He wouldn't let the people go by themselves. And so he went and so his son perished in the camps. And um, it was just, it's just a beautiful valiant effort of a Protestant community to, to reach out um, and, uh, and protect not only Jews, but also uh, the people that were fleeing the Nazis. So yes, I, I don't talk about Tukme because um, he wasn't um, central to my understanding that I wanted to communicate about the, the Nazi religion and the fight against it in particular. We have another um, question um, from Andrew Wilson. Why did Western scholars ignore Rosenberg? Oh, that's a very good question. And I appreciate that very much um, because uh, uh, the, that, that was why I literally ran to Ruth's office when I found out about the personal diary of, and, of, of, of Alfred Rosenberg having been found and translated. I mean, I was already calling the Holocaust Museum. When's it going to be translated? Because um, the realities were that they didn't want to face, I think in Germany, the German people um, were they were under such pressure, their children, because Rosenberg became minister of education. You can imagine, he wrote the myth of the 20th century and he has power over the education on the national level in Germany. 
So he was able to instigate and the children against their parents and the parents going to church and the children, they were being educated already and in the high school level as well. So you already had this terrible kind of tornado within each, each German family, you know, as far as uh, who was being educated, who was educating their children. I mean, by the thousands, they kicked out teachers, professors, not just Jewish, but those that did want did you had to sign the oath to Hitler if you wanted to keep teaching in the public schools once the Third Reich was established in, the, um, in 1933. Now, as far as scholars ignoring um, Al Alfred Rosenberg uh, since um, he was killed in, at Nuremberg, that's very true. And it's a very interesting situation that I have had in my research because, of course, every book that I have on my shelf dealing with the Third Reich, dealing with the Holocaust, dealing with, I go straight to the index and see how many references to Rosenberg there are, <laughs> because that's where I uh, can get a, an understanding of their understanding. The, uh, the Nazi religion. I think that they didn't want to give any credence to it because they didn't want to actually explore it and have to put it out there. Um, I'm sorry that they feel that way. And I'm very glad that now um, over 60 years later, we can start taking a look at it honestly and for what it really was. Thank you. And Runger, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer who organized the Confessing Church is the most famous Protestant martyr against Hitler. Does he figure in your book? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was um, a martyr to the cause. He did die very in 1944. They killed him and they just took him out and they and, and they hung him just before um, the end of the war uh, because his family was involved in uh, one of the uh, early assassination attempts uh, against Hitler. He was not indicted himself, but by association was put into prison. So he was in prison right outside of Berlin. His family was able to visit him quite often as well as other pastors. But, um, and actually he came to America twice and was very inspired by what he saw in America. And Karl Barth carried a very, very um, painful reality that the second time he was in America, Karl Barth called him back to Germany. So um, for Barth in his own personal um, uh, memoirs, he has a very hard time with that. But uh, Bonhoeffer was actually second to uh, Martin Neymuller. Martin Neymuller was actually the one who was very, very uh, key um, in being able to bring about the um, beginnings of the Confessing Church, which funny enough formed when there was a Nazi at a huge, it was the 450th anniversary of Luther. So it's huge, right? All of these, these, these church representatives by the thousands are in this big sports plots that you just saw the picture of. And they chose this man Kunst to get up there and speak. And he decides that he's just gonna reveal everything about positive Christianity, no more Old Testament. And there's parts of the New Testament and we need to move forward, forward with the Aryan race as the chosen. I mean, he just spilled the whole, the whole thing in front of all of these people of the cloth. So Martin Neymuller and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and were able to quickly um, get people that decided that they had to do something and form the Confessing Church, which led to Barman, as you know, and, um, and be able to get, um, thousands of these people that were present for that speech and realizing, oh my God, we've waited too long already. Um, but, um, but he was actually uh, important then uh, before he was early uh, put into prison. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, an extraordinary man, especially um, his uh, ethics and um, uh, book. Thank you. So Kathleen, we have two more questions. The next one is, um, uh, uh, I don't know who's, will you, from Emily Wentworth, um, Kathleen, will you give a conference on your book sometime in France? Will there eventually be a French version of the book to help enlighten the French about more about more concerning these tough times of World War II, considering the French are still slow to admit some of their collaboration with the Vichy government and the Nazi occupiers? Well, Emily, thank you so much for that question, because I certainly hope so. Uh, it, it would be interesting because the first version of my book is in French. Um, but it's, of course, a much more academic book. It was written for a degree in theology. And um, I would love to see this book, which is my pride and joy in my native language of English. And my, my whole um, vision is to be able to reach yourselves, you know, the, the greater educated public, and to be able to have people talking about this. Did you know that Nazism that had a religious component, self-defined, you know, and to be able to speak to people about it because it needs to be known. And I would love to be invited 
to France. I'm going to Scotland next month to speak at the European Academy of Religion, uh, and I'm going to be presenting two papers on the topic. And so I'm hoping that I will be able to meet some French. They're having a, a keynote speaker, uh, Jean-Luc Marion, who's a very well-known theologian in France. And on the back of my book is André Gounel, who um, uh, was one of my professors at Laval, and he's very famous, a Protestant theologian in France. So I'm hoping, I'm certainly hoping that Pierre Chaillet will maybe not be as, fa as famous as Jean Moulin, but I would certainly like to get his name known in France. Yeah. Kathleen, I think we have time for one more question from Alan Proctor. Uh, what steps were taken after the war to denazify de the churches in Germany and Austria? Well, I mean, the churches themselves took the steps. I mean, you had you had horrific things happen. I mean, the Cathedral of Strasbourg was turned into a barn and storage for munitions. I mean, there was a lot of reconstruction that had to happen besides just the bombing and what was destroyed in the different uh, churches. But um, interestingly enough, at the very end of Heschel's book, the picture that I showed you with the Nazified church on the cover in Cologne in 1935, her book goes into the members of that Institute for the Eradication of All Things Jewish and German Life. Um, and she goes into what happens to these theologians who adhered to positive Christianity, who took over those positions where people were kicked out at Bonn University and uh, Leipzig and all of the other universities in uh, Dresden in Germany. They, they, were, th they were thrown out by the hundreds. And um, those that, that replaced them um, where they were found uh, in uh, Germany later. I would like to say that um, if anyone's heard of the Klarsfelds, um, you have the amazing couple of the Klarsfelds, who she was a daughter of um, a German Nazi officer, and he was um, a Jew growing up in France, and they got married, and they both were lawyers, and they chased the Nazis that tried to save themselves in different parts of the world, and were very effective in Klaus Barbie being brought finally to trial. And so you, she also, and they also have a lot to say about uh, what happened with German um, that were uh, part of the persecution of the churches uh, after the war. So Kathleen, I think Kathleen, I think we're out of time, but we want to thank you so much for this this conversation about the Nazi religion and the rise of the French Christian resistance. I'm hoping that maybe Melissa can show that final slide one more time, um, so that we know where to order the book, and then as well, um, all of you who have signed up for this particular conference um, with. Um, will receive a link to the YouTube video as it has been recorded with the same information attached so that you, we hope you'll buy the book. We hope that, that so many of us will share what we've learned from Dr. Burton and from Ruth. And, um, and we thank you both very much for a revelatory um, conference on this, this, this very important and interesting topic. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Alliance Francaise USA. À la prochaine. À la prochaine. À la prochaine. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci d'être venu. Thank you all for coming.